Hello, I'm Alex Colvin, Dean of Cornell University School of Industrial Labor Relations. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to the third webinar in a new series, Equity in Focus, that we're co-hosting with the U.S. Department of Labor's Women's Bureau. It's a pleasure to be working with them on this series. Uh, it's also being co-hosted with ILR's Worker Institute, and I want to thank my colleagues at the Worker Institute for all their hard work on putting together this series. Today's webinar is going to focus on equity and focus building a diverse, inclusive, clean energy workforce. We're going to be talking about the issues relating to how the United States can tackle the climate crisis and also create high quality jobs, uh, in particular union jobs and those that benefit women and frontline communities of color that have suffered uh, disproportionately from pollution climate change, and historic inequities. This is one of the great challenges that we face as a society. We need to transition to a net zero emissions economy in coming decades. At the same time, this historic transformation will require a range of changes in the labor, economic, and employment space. There are opportunities there, millions of new jobs, that will be need to be created in the renewable energy and storage space. However, we need to ensure that these new jobs we are creating are accessible to communities that have been historically excluded from high quality union jobs in the energy sector. We've got a great lineup of speakers today. I'm really looking forward to hearing from them and thinking about the solutions that we as a society can come up with to ensure that we have equity as we address the enormous challenges of the climate crisis. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, I'm Gail Golden, Senior Advisor at the U.S. Department of Labor's Women's Bureau. I'm delighted to join all of you for our third webinar in a series we are co-hosting with Cornell's Worker Institute, Equity in Focus, Building a Diverse, inclusive, clean energy workforce. The Women's Bureau is the only federal agency authorized by Congress to represent the needs and interests of working women. We have been fighting for more than 100 years for greater rights for women in the workplace, and that includes good jobs and a safe environment. We believe that in order to reach gender equity, we need to tackle discrimination in all forms, raise wages in women-dominated sectors, and create pathways into higher paying fields that are currently male dominated. Today, our all-star panel will talk about the ways the US can tackle the climate crisis while also creating high quality union jobs for women and communities of color that suffer the most from climate change, pollution, and historic inequities. Across the globe, women are less likely to survive and more likely to be injured during climate disasters. At the same time, women and girls are less able to access assistance and relief, which only makes them more vulnerable to future disasters. These impacts are also not uniform. Women of color, older women, LGBTQ women, women and girls with disabilities, migrant women, and women and girls living in rural, remote, and low-income areas are impacted even more. Not only does climate change disproportionately impact women and people of color, they're also less likely to be employed in jobs in the clean energy workforce. Occupational segregation, the highly gendered division of women and men into different types of jobs is widespread across our society, including in jobs most likely to benefit from investments in the climate economy. Women make up only a quarter of workers in the energy sector and only 32% of workers in renewable energy. At the same time, women make up less than 13% of apprentices in the United States. The good news is, since taking office, the Biden-Harris administration has made a commitment to clear and ambitious climate goals. The executive order tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad and catalyzing America's clean energy economy through federal sustainability 
directs the federal government to reach net zero emissions from federal procurement by 2050 and directs the federal government to advance environmental justice and equity. President Biden also announced a commitment to achieving a 50% reduction in emissions by 2030 and to creating millions of good paying middle class union jobs in the climate economy. And the administration launched the Building Performance Standards Coalition, a first of its kind partnership of 33 states and local governments dedicated to delivering decarbonized buildings. The Biden-Harris administration launched the Justice 40 initiative to ensure that federal agencies deliver at least 40% of the overall benefits from federal investments in climate and clean energy to disadvantaged communities, which includes jobs created through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment Act. The Biden-Harris administration is leading a historic economic recovery. In order to create an economy that is fair, inclusive, and resilient, we must seize this opportunity to address deep and longstanding inequities that continue to hold back women and people of color and ensure equitable access to jobs in every sector. Today, we will hear from a panel of experts who are working on these very issues at the federal, state, and local levels. We hope you'll be inspired by today's conversation and that we hear from all of you about the work that you are doing. Good afternoon or good morning if you're on the West Coast. Welcome to the third Equity and Focus webinar, Building a Diverse, Inclusive, Clean Energy Workforce, co-hosted by the U.S. Department of Labor's Women's Bureau and the Worker Institute at Cornell University's ILR School. My name is Lara Skinner. I'm the director of the Labor Leading on Climate, Climate Jobs Program at Cornell, and I'm delighted to moderate this panel and this important conversation about how we ensure equitable access to new clean energy jobs for women, people of color, and other historically excluded communities. And how do we build the diverse and inclusive clean energy workforce that we need in this country to tackle climate change and historic inequality? We have an excellent lineup of speakers today, and we hope that you'll find today's discussion an important venue for sharing strategies, experiences, and lessons learned. We'll take questions at the end of the webinar, so please put your questions in the chat. This conversation is particularly timely for a couple of reasons. One, the United Nations-backed Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out with its latest climate science report two months ago. That report was startling. It said that the window for limiting catastrophic global warming is rapidly closing. It also said, as many of us know personally, the extreme weather events are becoming much more frequent and intense. And as Gail mentioned in her opening comments, women, low-income communities, communities of color, and other historically excluded groups suffer first and worst from climate change and pollution. And they have fewer resources to recover and adapt to climate change and extreme weather events. The report's conclusion was that it is imperative for all of the world's countries, especially wealthy countries like the US, to rapidly accelerate their transitions to a net zero, low carbon, clean energy economy. In other words, climate change is a fundamental challenge of our time. The second reason this conversation is so important and timely is that the US Energy and Employment Jobs Report by the Department of Energy came out yesterday. It showed that U.S. energy sector jobs are growing faster than overall U.S. employment. Solar and wind installer jobs have been the fastest growing jobs for a number of years now. Looking ahead, if we are going to meet the U.S.'s goal of having a net zero emissions economy by 2050, we will need to build a whole new clean energy infrastructure that will require millions of jobs. Most studies estimate that the U.S. will create between 15 and 25 million new jobs in the next 15 years. That's the good news. Tackling climate change is an opportunity for us to build a new economy, to create many high quality union, family and community sustaining jobs, and make sure that this new economy centers the needs of frontline communities and ex historically excluded groups like women, communities of color, people with disabilities and others. It's also important to keep in mind that the transition to clean energy will be disruptive. It's going to affect all parts of our economy. And in addition to creating new jobs, we'll see job loss too. We're already seeing job loss in many parts of the traditional energy sector, places where unions have fought hard to make these jobs good, 
well-paying, safe jobs. We'll need to figure out how to protect and support the workers and communities that are negatively impacted by this transition and at the same time ensure that new clean energy jobs are high quality jobs. That's part of the work we need to do to build an equitable clean energy economy. So in short, before I turn it over to our speakers, the climate crisis presents us with a major challenge and a major opportunity. We must act fast to avoid the worst impacts of climate change and to build the new clean energy economy we need. We'll need to create a lot of jobs and put many people to work. The question is, how do we do this in an equitable way? How do we accelerate climate work, make sure that new clean energy jobs are high quality, family and community sustaining jobs, and make sure that we don't replicate existing historic inequities, gender, race, and economic inequality. We need to build a large clean energy economy that is fair, diverse, and inclusive. With that backdrop, I want to move us to the fabulous lineup of speakers that we have for you today. Uh, first up, we have two experts from the Center for American Progress who will set the scene for today's discussion. Marina Zavaranakova, Senior Fellow for Workforce Development, and Auburn Bell, a policy analyst for energy and environmental policy, will provide a brief overview of the climate crisis and the state of today's clean energy workforce. Second up, Matt Schlobaum, Executive Director of Maine's AFL-CIO, and Laura Fortman, Maine's Commissioner of Labor, will talk about how the state of Maine has been advancing its climate action and pairing it with a plan to create a pathway for women, indigenous groups, and other historically excluded communities into high quality family and community sustaining jobs in the clean energy economy. Very excited to hear about that. After Matt and Laura, April Sims, Secretary Treasurer of the Washington State Labor Council, Allison Ziogas, U.S. Director of Labor Relations at Orsted, the offshore wind company, and Amy Peterson, Senior Advisor for Industry Relations at the U.S. Department of Energy's Loan Programs Office, will provide us with their perspective on how we build a diverse, inclusive clean energy workforce and draw on the insights and experiences from their different vantage points. So again, thank you for joining us for this important webinar and discussion. Um, we're excited to be here with you today. We will have a question and answer segment at the end of the program. So again, please put any and all questions that you have in the chat so that we can take them uh, during that segment. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Marina and Auburn from the Center for American Progress to set the stage for today's discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Lara. Uh, we are so excited to be here. My name is Marina Javrankova, and I'm a senior fellow for Workforce Development at Center for American Progress. We're a progressive nonpartisan think tank located in DC. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, Auburn Bell, on our energy and environment team. And together, we're here to set the stage about why it's so critical to build an inclusive, diverse, clean energy workforce. We at American Progress, like all of us here today, are particularly excited about the historic opportunity we have in front of us in the form of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Over the ne next several years, we will be working with many of the partners on this webinar and others to see how we can maximize the share of infrastructure dollars that flow to projects that promote inclusive growth, tackle climate change and in environmental injustice, create equitable access to high quality jobs, and redress historical harms caused by discriminatory policies and projects that led to structural disinvestment and community destruction. Zeroing in on the workforce part of these goals, when we think about investments in certain sectors, it's often useful to think about a few questions. One, what does this sector do? Is it valuable? Is it something we want to promote in our society? Two, are these good jobs? And if this is valuable work, how do we make sure that we show we value the people doing it by making their jobs good quality? And three, who has access to these good jobs doing important work? How do we ensure that we are building an inclusive, equitable industry? So to answer that first question, what does this sector do and what's the imperative? I'm going to turn it over to Auburn, who will set the stage about the climate crisis. And then we'll talk a bit more about how we can build the clean energy sector to be inclusive from the ground up. Auburn. David, um, I'm happy to be here with you all at this critical moment in the climate crisis to discuss inclusive and strategic solutions. Energy is at the heart of the climate challenge and clean energy is a key to the solution. Last month, the UN released a report stating the greenhouse gas concentrations, the rise in sea levels, ocean temperatures, and ocean acidification all reached record highs in 2021. This comes on top of the 2022 IPCC report that states further delays in global action will cause us to miss a brief and rapidly closing window for a livable and sustainable future, with scientists stating it's now or never for climate action. 
scientists have projected that the world is likely to reach or exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming in the early 2030s. And the 1.5 degree uh, Celsius target could be denounced as impossible as early as 2025, three years from now, with some scientists already suggesting that it is impossible. The burden of climate change undoubtedly all, um, falls on our most vulnerable and disadvantaged communities, already bearing the brunt of environmental injustices. Climate change exacerbates systemic, economic, and racial inequality, and simultaneously threatens public health, national security, the safety and well-being of communities, and the strength of our economy. While communities face the health impacts of dirty air, Black Americans are particularly at risk. Black people bear a 54% higher health burden from particulate air emissions due to the burning of fossil fuels than the overall American population. 28, it's also 28% higher than those living under the poverty line. As extreme events become more and more common in the United States due to the worsening effects of climate change, access to utilities like electricity and water will continually be strained. Blackouts and intermittent utility interruptions impact low income and communities of color most negatively. Just impacts of Hurricane Irma and Maria in Puerto Rico and how to this day there continuously be our um, rolling blackouts on the island or just look to the winter storms in Texas and how millions of Texans went without power. So what do we do? The Biden administration has proposed a target of running on 80% clean electricity by 2030. To meet that, we will need to ramp up efficiency, cut and in half, increase clean energy resources and electrify almost all of our transportation and get fossil fuels out of our buildings. But it also means the potential for a lot of good union jobs. Here involves rooting out biases in our key segments of this sector, workforce training, access to clean energy jobs within marginalized communities and access to capital for minority owned businesses. Federal and state clean energy policy must prioritize investing in disadvantaged communities by supporting workforce development programs, improving equitable access to STEM programs for underrepresented groups, developing energy access in black and brown communities, and protecting and promoting unionized clean energy jobs. The Biden administration's Justice 40 initiative puts us on that path by committing 40% of climate-related federal investments to frontline and disadvantaged communities. The 40% could support the deployment of community-owned renewable energy assets to ease the disproportionate energy burden experienced by marginalized communities, but it could also organically create and support diverse clean energy careers. It could distribute generation and provide technical assistance for utility scale community solar projects. And the 40% commitment could support black and minority owned small businesses becoming clean energy experts and provide affordable energy to low and moderate income families in their own communities. Happening now and is worsening rapidly. The only way to get ourselves out of this crisis is to ensure we do not repeat the errors of our past as we strategize a clean energy future. I'll now hand it back to Marina to talk more about a framework for investing in an inclusive energy workforce. Thanks so much, Auburn. So I think Auburn's made a pretty compelling case about why the climate crisis requires our immediate attention and our focus, our resources, and our creativity. Um, but to build that infrastructure, we need to have uh, people, right? We need people ready to access these jobs that will build us the infrastructure that we need. So there's a huge opportunity here. It's really difficult to fix something that was built poorly. It's much easier to do it the first time, uh, the right way. And that's the opportunity we have with clean energy. On the one hand, though, we're building a new sector with new jobs and new operating roles. But on the other hand, we're not starting completely from scratch, right? We have a legacy that needs to be improved upon. As Gail mentioned in her opening remarks, today women's participation in the energy sector is much lower than it should be. Women are 25% of workers in the energy sector and 32% of the renewable energy workforce. And those numbers are even more disproportionate for women of color and women with disabilities. 
However, these numbers are also significantly lower for certain occupations. For example, electricians so critical to the work of building clean energy infrastructure are 98% male. Chemical engineers are 87% male. Wind turbine technicians and solar photovoltaic installers, two of the fastest growing occupations in the United States, are also overwhelmingly male. So creating access to good jobs for women is critical now more than ever, as women, and particularly women of color, have borne the brunt of caretaking for family and children during the pandemic, and were also disproportionately on the front line in the workplace. Just one of the many reasons that women's labor force participation hasn't returned to pre-pandemic levels. There are several steps required to build this inclusive workforce, and we'll hear about examples from partners across the country that are leading the way in making this industry the industry we want to see. First is entry. We need pipelines into professions that are traditionally male and white dominated and ensure those pipelines recruit and support from populations traditionally underrepresented in this workforce. This means investing in apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship models and ensuring that there's equitable access to hours, mentorship, support services, and other high quality training programs. Second is retention, and I can't understate how important this is. It's all well and good to recruit, but we can't recruit people into a profession when, when the environment makes them likely to leave. EEOC data shows that women are most likely to file sexual harassment claims in industries that are the most male dominated. Anti-harassment policies, monitoring and reporting are all critical to improve retention as our participation goals for women and workers of color set and enforced by federal, state, and local government. Third is quality. The clean energy sector will be in large part funded by taxpayer dollars, and taxpayer dollars should support jobs that are good quality. This means advancing labor standards and the right to organize, bargaining collectively, and ensuring workers are paid decent prevailing wages. On that note, I'm going to pass it back to Lara, who will introduce some of the amazing speakers that are making these goals a reality. Great. Well, thank you, Marina and Aubrey, for those excellent contributions and providing that helpful context on the climate crisis, as well as the state of the clean energy workforce. I think your assessment continues to reinforce um, what so many have said about climate change and the transition to a net zero emissions economy. It's a massive challenge and it's an incredible opportunity. And I think we really want to hone in on that opportunity today. So thank you for that excellent scene setting for the rest of our discussion. Now I'd like to turn it over to Commissioner of Labor, Laura Fortman, and Maine AFL-CIO Executive Director, Matt Schlobaum. Laura was nominated to serve as Commissioner of Labor in Maine in 2019. She leads their 500-person staff. Prior to serving as Commissioner, Laura was the Executive Director of the Francis Perkins Center, and she served as the Maine Commissioner of Labor from 2003 to 2010. I have had the privilege of working with Matt and the main AFL-CIO for the past couple of years as they built a vision, program, and organization to tackle climate change, create union jobs, and center frontline communities in this transition. In the last legislative session, you all had some important victories to advance this vision, making sure that we're accelerating climate work in the state of Maine and creating a pathway for historically excluded communities into these new jobs. So Matt, Laura, I'm gonna turn it over to you to tell, you more, tell us more about what you've been doing in Maine. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lara. I'm gonna kick things off. Um, and I just wanna say, I, I'm, I'm Matt Schlobom, Executive Director of the Maine AFL-CIO, and I'm really honored to be um, part of this rock star crew of folks, um, Marina and Auburn, just hit it out of the park, I think with a very clear-eyed analysis. Commissioner Fortman has moved this work forward for for a long time and done tremendous work in the state. Um, April Sims is one of my heroes, the work she's done in the labor movement to move a racial justice practice and racial justice analysis is just second to none. We've learned a lot in Maine from the training um, that the Washington State Labor Council has done. And Allison's work building out an offshore wind economy is just incredibly inspiring and where we need to go, that's a high road economy. And the work we're trying to do around pre-apprenticeships and apprenticeships in Maine really builds on the visionary work coming out of New York City and New York State that Amy and others have done. So just, just really humble to be with you all. Um, Commissioner Fortman and I want to try and lift up Maine as a case study. And I think um, we're a small state of 1.3 million people. We're a labor movement at around 11 to 12 percent density. So we follow the national average. We do not bring, uh, we try to punch above our weight, but we are not New York City or Boston or Los Angeles in terms of the strength of, of unions here. And we've been able to move the ball 
forward pretty effectively, I would say. Um, and so what we want to do is, is to just look at um, what we've done, sort of frame things up, set the landscape, look at what we've done in the space of apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeships and how we're trying to build that out with a very strong equity lens, look at what we've done in the space of legislation and policy and how we've used use that to tackle the climate crisis, lift labor standards, and open um, doors of access and advance equity, and then just think about the key role that organizing plays in tackling an economy so deeply structured by race and gender and immigration status and geography. Um, so just on the labor side of this, um, and the climate crisis, um, you know, we saw as the labor movement, this emergent economy coming on board as we decarbonize and as we need to decarbonize incredibly quickly. And the labor movement's history runs through energy, right? We know that, we know workers organized in the mines and that built um, the, the labor movement in this country. And we really felt like we shouldn't spend a hundred years trying to turn these new jobs into good quality jobs. And that there's an opportunity to do that much quicker on the job side, on the climate side, on the equity side. Um, the first thing we did, um, thanks to the great work of Lara and her team at Cornell, was to reframe this crisis. Um, there is a climate crisis and there is an inequality crisis. And we have to think about those things together. And the inequality crisis is a crisis of wealth, a crisis of inequality of income, of power, and of opportunity. And we know that that cuts so deeply along lines of race, along lines of gender, along lines of immigration status, along lines of geography. Um, and you don't transform an economy so deeply structured along those things by simply replicating the past. Um, you have to disrupt the organizational norms within the labor movement, the policy norms that defer to neutrality um, in a policy approach. And you have to be quite explicit that if we are going to restructure the economy in a way that advances equity, we have to be explicit and deliberate about that in our organizing, in our policy, and in our workforce development. Um, and so we built an organization through a lot of educational work, the Maine Labor Climate Council, um, to tackle these issues together, to really say to the labor movement, there is a threat here, yes, and there is a colossal opportunity. And if we seize that opportunity, we can grow the labor movement, tackle one of the most pressing issues, and blow the doors of opportunity wide open for millions millions of workers who historically have been denied those rights and opportunities. Um, and people in the labor movement have seized on that. And we've won real successes that we'll talk more about. We've won policy victories that have done those things um, and won project labor agreements, advanced equity standards in our workforce training system. Um, and so I'll kick it over to Commissioner Fortman and we'll come back and unpack each of those boxes. <laughs> Great, thanks, Matt. Um, so I wanna just step back uh, a second and talk a little bit about from a state perspective. So Governor Janet Mills um, came into office in January of 2019. And one of the first things that she did was um, start putting plans in place to address the climate change. So there was a climate council. So just as Matt said, the labor um, movement has a council looking at these issues. There's also a council created by the governor that's um, addressing this challenge and bringing in a broad range of stakeholders. There were four key goals of the Climate Action Plan. The title of the plan is Maine Won't Wait. And I think just based on what we've heard today, we can understand why no one should be waiting. And the four key goals were um, to reduce Maine's greenhouse gas emissions, avoid the impacts and cost of inaction, and then the last two goals were foster economic opportunity and prosperity and advance equity through climate response. And I think it's those last two goals that um, are most relevant to the conversation that we're having today. Um, the state and the governor recognized that we needed to support good paying jobs, attract uh, the other thing we didn't mention about the state of Maine is we also are the oldest state by median age in the country. 
So we were seeing um, a real challenge in terms of workforce attraction, as well as retention in general, and saw these jobs as being an opportunity to, um, to support uh, good paying jobs and attract new workers across, um, across uh, sectors. And equity had to be baked into all of this. Um, as I said, uh, my governor is Janet Mills. Um, she was the first uh, woman governor in our history, and the issue of um, equity is near and dear to her heart and at the center of what she, she does. So when we started um, tackling some of these issues, we had the pandemic. We already heard how women were impacted by the pandemic and people of color. Um, we started developing strategies that would specifically address some of those inequities and help women, people of color, um, obtain uh, and, and thrive, um, uh, have a real path forward and thrive. And we started looking at primarily apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship and how could we use some of the ARPA funding to support those activities. And we set aside roughly $12 million in apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship funding, which to some of the larger states may not sound like very much, but it was a significant, it is a significant investment from Maine. Um, we made 14 grant awards and clean energy is one of the areas that we focused on. Um, and when you look at apprenticeship in Maine, we've heard some of the national numbers, but in Maine, about 17% of all apprentices are women, 5.6% are people of color, and 1.5% are people with disabilities. There is obviously a long way um, for us to grow in these areas, and we are committed to doing that. Um, and one of the projects, actually, I'll turn it back over to Matt, because the main AFL-CIO is one of the grant recipients, and we're very excited about how we can take this apprenticeship model and really um, make it um, meaningful. I think in the past, all of us have given lots of lip service to, to being inclusive, but I think we have an opportunity now to turn that aspirational yes, we want to do something meaningful and um, put in place benchmarks, measurements, metrics, and some accountability to make sure that we achieve um, what we say we're going to do. Every single one of those grants requires a plan, um, a diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility plan. There's also a requirement in there for all participants to um, to uh, um, participate in a badging program that at least increases uh, some basic understanding of what is it that we mean when we're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and set some clear standards um, for the programs. But Matt, <laughs> I know you're really excited about what, what's going on. We are very excited. Thank you, Commissioner Fortman. Um, and just, just to share a little bit more about this workforce development piece. So we submitted a proposal, we were awarded a grant. It's a three-year, $1.5 million um, contract. Um, and so the Maine AFL-CIO, in partnership with the Maine Building and Construction Trades Council, the Laborers New England um, Training Fund, and um, IBEW 1253, are building out two um, equity-focused pre-apprenticeship programs. Um, and I should say these really build on the model from New York. Um, Melissa Shetler, um, who was the executive director at um, Pathways to Apprenticeship, um, was incredibly helpful and inspiring. And if you want to see a model that I think has done tremendous work, that program is just amazing and has created a pipeline for justice involved folks directly into some of the best union apprenticeships and jobs in the country. And Amy can talk about um, non-traditional employment for women and, and some of the other the, the apprenticeship collective in New York that's just done phenomenal work. So we're, we are coming at this very humbly and trying to build on the great work that's been done in other places. Um, but the basic vision here is we um, will be running two to three um, six-week 
pre-apprenticeship cohorts um, each year for the next three years, um, very sub-granting to immigrant organizations, organizations of color, women's organizations, um, and justice-involved organizations um, to really develop direct recruitment plans um, so that folks have a pathway to direct entry into registered apprenticeship programs, um, working with our affiliate unions to really think about what do they need to do differently um, to have folks be able to succeed and have folks feel welcomed and have folks feel supported and create a union environment um, that is free from oppression and harassment and is rooted much more in collective liberation. Um, and so those programs will be starting um, in the next couple of months um, and really giving people the hands-on skills, giving people a broad sense of, do I want to become an electrician? Do I want to be a tin knocker? What is the carpenter's training center like? What programs really have higher densities of women or immigrants or people of color? What kind of supports will I get? And so then people can make um, their build relationships and make decisions about what path they want to proceed on. And a lot of that right now cuts across the clean energy sector. Um, and there's just this tremendous opportunity to marry pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship with growing fields that address the climate crisis and we've baked in very explicit commitments to equity and to tearing down the structures that historically have structured our economy along lines of race and gender and immigration status. Um, and I think, you know, there's really strong stipends and wraparound supports baked into these programs. And there's a lot that we know about what we need to do to succeed. And I'll just say the interest to date has been through the roof and people want to know how to get into these programs, how to have a seat at the table, and it's incumbent on the labor movement to, to blow those doors open and to change cultures that historically, if we're honest, in most cases, many cases, have, have excluded folks. Yeah, and Matt, the other thing that I just want to add to that is um, not only are the labor unions doing this, but we'll have a cohort of union and non-union um, organizations engaged in this. And uh, we see this as a real opportunity to spread those values across the system um, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and uh, and we're looking forward to that because the diversity, equity, um, and inclusion pieces are baked into every single one of these pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs. And that's important to us too is that every one of these programs and that people learn from the great work that you're doing um, and that we spread that. That's they, great. Yeah, no, and I was going to say, and I think you probably want to jump in and talk a little bit about how some of the, um, you know, that we're doing prevailing wage uh, as well. So some of the enforcement pieces that were connected to the legislation are, again, across the board, um, and that that's an exciting opportunity to see how can we raise the standards. Um, that's great. Yeah, I do. I want to say a few words on the policy landscape, because one of the other tools we're using to try and transform this sector, raise standards in this sector and um, equitably open opportunities and career pathways is through um, the governor's leadership, the commissioner's leadership, the state legislature. So we've passed four core bills in Maine in the last three years um, to really achieve those equity and job quality standard goals in the renewable energy sector. Um, I'll, I'll just name the four and then unpack them a little bit more. So this, this last year, um, Representative Scott Cuddy passed a climate jobs and equity bill um, that um, did a number of things. Um, it created a statutory framework for pre-apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs um, that really took seriously historically marginalized communities and equity. And so there have to, you as a to be a certified program, you have to have a very explicit outreach program to historically marginalized communities. There's very strong wraparound support, stipends, way to take seriously if folks 
want to get access to pre-apprenticeship programs, we have to be real about what that costs someone to take five or six weeks of their life. Um, there's a direct entry provision for direct entry into certified registered apprenticeship programs. There's a clear evaluation on progress around equity goals. And there's a funding prioritization of programs that demonstrate successful enrollment of folks from historically marginalized communities. That bill also applied for the first time ever prevailing wage on renewable energy construction projects over two megawatts. Um, and it incentivizes in the state's renewable portfolio standard process um, projects that um, are built under a project labor agreement and encourages that. Um, so that's a historic win in Maine to really advance equity and um, good quality jobs on renewable energy projects. We also, in the last two years, won two project labor agreements in law, one on an offshore floating, uh, offshore wind floating research array um, that has a project labor agreement on it, which would be an 11 turbine research array in the Gulf of Maine, another project labor agreement that was funded through ARPA funding on climate resilient affordable housing and energy efficient affordable housing. Um, and then Representative Chloe Maxman had a bill um, a state Green New Deal bill to um, require um, apprenticeship utilization requirements on renewable energy projects over two megawatts. And when you put all those pieces together, coupled with the governor's commitment to um, a clean energy economy and some of the policy initiatives to build that out and the federal government support and um, the infrastructure bill, you start to build a toolbox where we can address historic inequities and build out this economy in the way that some of the initial speakers outlined with quality and opportunity um, and strong job quality standards baked in. Because I think in the labor movement, we know very clearly good jobs don't just fall from the sky. And to date, the clean energy economy has been very uneven in terms of who has access to it and in terms of the quality of jobs in um, these sectors. And we only build those higher quality jobs when workers have more bargaining power, when we use the leverage of policy, and when we have really meaningful workforce development standards. Um, and so I'll kick it back to, to Commissioner Fortman just to share a little bit about how the department is thinking about implementing and enforcing this new legislative landscape um, in a way that advances equity and lifts up the quality of the jobs. Great, thanks, Matt. And I think that, um, that this is a new territory for all of us, and we've been uh, working very hard to uh, do that work of putting together guidance and rules. And I, I want to just stress the importance of uh, engaging stakeholders and working um, across both um, the legislative branch and the executive branch, as well as with uh, organizations like labor unions, to make sure that the, the um, education and enforcement pieces that we have in place uh, are meaningful and easy to understand. Um, there has been, um, this was not smooth. I think ma Matt made it sound like, um, you know, there was legislation that was introduced and things moved quickly and smoothly. Um, and that was not, um, it, it took lots of compromise and conversation, and I think we're still in the aspirational phases of much of the, um, the uh, legislation. Um, the most recent piece goes into effect in January 2023, and we're still working on it, but uh, prevailing wage uh, has been expanded into this sector, and we're very excited about that. Okay, should we wrap lara that would be great thank you matt and laura that's awesome so the last thing i'll just say to close this out is i mean i think we are clearly in a historic moment of threat and opportunity obviously threat for women's rights threats for advancing equity threats of the climate crisis and we're in a moment where workers are organizing in new ways and the labor movement is is attempting to tackle this climate crisis in a much deeper way and where there's just tremendous opportunity there. And, and the point I think I'll just leave on is, um, you know, there is emergence in emergency. Um, and we, I think the last piece of this puzzle is the organizing piece. I think in an economy that is so deeply structured by race 
and gender and immigration status. And that is just so deeply historically baked into who we are as a people and the rules of the road. Policy is a tool, workforce development is a tool, but if we don't organize wall to wall in some of these sectors, um, it is incredibly difficult to truly transform power relationships and advance equity in the way we need to. And I just, I think the labor movement has to think very seriously about how we organize and in tandem with that, transform our internal cultures to advance equity. So um, I'll leave it there and pass it back to you, Lara. Well, thank you so much, Laura and Matt. Thank you both for the discussion today and the amazing work that you're doing in Maine. Uh, it's just so inspiring to hear about how you're developing and implementing a truly intersectional approach to taking on climate change, gender and race equity, workforce development, and job quality and access. I know this is really hard to do, but I think it's the only way that we you know, truly build a fair, more just society and build the broad public support for climate action that we need. Um, and I think you're putting together so many essential um, pieces. And I think I and, and probably so many others really laud what you're doing. So I know in you know, talking with the leaders of the pre-apprentice programs in New York City, that when they're recruiting women, justice involved individuals, others into those programs, there's tremendous interest in working in the clean energy economy, which really aligns with what you Matt, said, Matt, around you know, interest being through the roof. So I think it really speaks to how front and center uh, the climate crisis is for many frontline communities and how important it is to create equitable access to these jobs. So I know this is a model that's you know really instructive for other states to learn from, and I'm sure you'll um, you know get a, a bunch of questions from your fellow panelists as well as the audience um, as we move forward. So thank you. And now I'm going to turn to our other three speakers, um, Secretary uh, Treasurer April Sims. I'd like to go to you next. Uh, you were elected Secretary Treasurer in 2018. You started your term in 2019. You're the first woman of color and first black person to be elected as a Washington State Labor Council executive officer. Um, April, you know, uh, you're the secretary treasurer of one of the most union dense states in the country. Um, as Matt mentioned, you have led groundbreaking equity and racial justice work. Um, and you're operating in a state that is known for leading aggressive climate action. Uh, your governor ran for president on a climate platform. So talk to me a little bit about how the labor movement in Washington state is using climate policy to center the needs and experiences of workers and frontline communities. What are the equity impacts of this work that you're seeing? Thank you, April. Uh, well, thank you, Laura. Um, thank you for inviting me to participate in today's conversation. It really is a privilege to be on this panel with so many innovative and dedicated folks. Uh, Matt, I appreciate the shout out and I love hearing the work that's happening in Maine and look forward to following your lead on this work. Uh, I do wanna start first by acknowledging that I am joining you all from Coast Salish land, the traditional and unceded lands of the Puyallup tribe. And I wanna take a moment to honor and thank their elders past and present for the privilege of being on their land. Um, I should say that we know that equity is about process as well as outcomes, which means those closest to the problem are also closest to the solution. So we are working to engage and center the needs, of, needs and voices of workers and frontline communities in all of our policy efforts. Through the creation of a racial equity policy toolkit, we're really challenging ourselves in the labor movement to change our culture from one that uh, says a rising tide lifts all boats to really thinking about what boats we should be focusing on, knowing that the conditions that raise those boats raises all, bo all boats. And that work extends to our conversations around the climate crisis and the clean energy economy. Now, historically, we've talked about climate policy in terms of environmental policies and impacts and big polluters, right? Um, and we know that that's certainly a big part of the conversation, but we're shifting the narrative to one that focuses on climate jobs and climate justice, because we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to address income inequality and the issues impacting workers, families, and communities through this emerging green energy economy and making sure that this next generation of union jobs or this next generation of jobs are union jobs, good union jobs in energy, manufacturing, construction, operations, and maintenance, because there are so many possibilities. But um, I should tell you all that I can't really talk about climate jobs and climate policy without thinking about my big sister, Nina. My sister, Nina, and her husband, Tom, worked big 
big construction projects for many years. And in 2009, at the height of the Great Recession, when the work dried up, she and her husband lost everything. It was a slow process, right? They picked up odd jobs to make ends meet, used up their savings, cashed in their retirement, and eventually lost their home. But when they heard that there was work in the oil fields in Williston, North Dakota, they packed up their fifth wheel and they chased the work in an effort to rebuild. They survived five cold North Dakota winters in that fifth wheel, saving up enough money to pay off their bills and buy a house. And for a few years, things were good. They were able to start planning for their future. But then my sister got sick and she got really sick. I mean, they tested her for everything, ALS, MS, lupus, leukemia. They couldn't figure out what was causing the rapid and serious decline in her health. And finally, a doctor thought, well, maybe it's environmental because she was exposed to so many serious chemicals at work. So she went to stay with her in-laws in Billings, Montana. And after a few years or a few months, her health improved, right? I'm happy to share with you all that she's healthy today, but you should know that her life looks different. She can't go home for very long. She and her husband's life have changed. The plans that they had for their future has changed. And the thing is, it wasn't just the harsh chemicals she was exposed to at work. It was the fact that she was working 12 to 14 hour days, sometimes 86 days in a row. And she did that for years, sacrificing her health for a financial future that she may not be around to enjoy. And that's the thing that we don't talk about when we talk about climate and climate policy. The workers and the impact to workers, workers like my sister Nina, you know, we've historically talked about polluters in terms of what they're extracting from our earth, but not about what they're extracting from our workers. We talk about how they treat our resources like they're inextinguishable, but not about how they treat our workers like they're inexhaustible. We talk about climate policy in terms of impacts to the environment, but we don't talk about climate policy in terms of impacts to workers, families, and communities, and in terms of impact to our economy. So much like Matt mentioned, they're doing in Maine, we're working to change that narrative in Washington state. We know that through the right policy, we can ensure that workers are protected, polluters are held accountable, and these new emerging green energy jobs are created with the same blueprint we use to create the good union jobs that exist today. Jobs that pay a livable wage and provide a glide path to the middle class. Jobs that provide the dignity that comes from working hard and making enough money to take care of our families. And jobs that secure financial security for generations to come. So in Washington state, we've been working with Lara and the climate jobs team to identify policies and projects that both address the climate crisis and create real economic opportunities. We're working with our affiliated unions to identify our priorities, and those priorities include the potential impact to targeted communities, uh, projects that lift pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs, the use of project labor agreements and labor peace agreements, the ability to define strong just transition language for workers who will be impacted by these changes. And we're moving forward with the stories of workers like my sister at the center. There are so many opportunities in clean energy. We know we have to be at the table for workers, families, and communities, or we'll be left behind. So I'm looking forward to the rest of today's conversation and uh, questions that might come up from participants. Thank you, Lara. Wonderful. Thank you, April. I really appreciate how you grounded this conversation by telling your sister's story. Thank you for doing that. Um, hard story to hear, but I think, you know, this is a historic transition, this transition that we're going to go through. And I think your sister's story really drives home how difficult and impersonal this transition is and how important it is to center the needs of workers and communities in this transition. And I think that's a role that only organized labor can play. So, you know, thank you for your leadership and the work that you're doing in Washington. Um, next, I'd like to call on Allison uh, Ziogas. Allison, um, you're a graduate of the pre-apprentice program in New York City, non-traditional employment for women an IBW Local 3 member, and now uh, the director of U.S. Labor Relations for the largest offshore wind company in the world, Orsted. Um, and you were at the center of signing a historic project of labor agreement that just happened between Orsted, 
um, and North America's building trades unions on offshore wind. So, so delighted to have you here today. From your perspective, what can an employer do to insert equity into the new clean energy jobs that they're creating? Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Dr. Skinner. Um, th thanks for inviting me and, and thanks to our audience for being interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, as Marina and Auburn highlighted, the energy industry globally and here in the U.S. has been far from, the far from representative of the dynamic and diverse world that it serves. And the more that we can understand challenges and opportunities from a diverse array of perspectives, the better. So thank you to the Women's Bureau and Worker Institute for convening this discussion. So our company sees diversity, equity, and inclusion as an essential part of the work that we do to build a world that runs entirely on green energy. Our motto is talent is diverse by nature. Diversity in age, race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, physical or mental ability, neural cognition, and lived experience is proven to make organizations more effective. But it's not enough just to make the business case for diversity. Orsted is a mission-driven company hoping to change the way that we power our communities in order to create a better world. As some folks may know, and as, as uh, Dr. Skinner mentioned, Orsted is the largest uh, developer of offshore wind globally and here in the U.S. And with more than five gigawatts of offshore wind power under development from Rhode Island to Maryland, Orsted has an enormous potential to be a powerful platform for change, both by leading by example and through uh, policy engagement. Creating a more sustainable world doesn't stop at green energy. And for Orsted, sustainability means pursuing high road wages, best in class measures across health and safety, governance and workers' rights, gender equality and empowerment, healthcare and social protection and racial justice. But we know that unless we can bring others along, our individual push for sustainability is in vain. And we need partners. We really had to ask ourselves and our partners collectively, how do we ensure that the energy systems of the future are built in a new and a different way? And how do we ensure inequities of the past are not reproduced as we build this new industry? So while the North Star most fundamental component of how we think about people within our framework is focusing on pursuing high road wages so that we're not delivering people to low quality work, uh, but creating an environment where people can thrive goes beyond this data point. We can't credibly build an inclusive offshore wind industry without addressing fundamental injustice, injustice inequity and violence that disproportionately impact people of color and women. And I'd like to tell you uh, about some of the initiatives that we're undertaking. Um, and this is not to suggest that we have it all figured out. It's quite the opposite. Uh, as the pursuit of justice and equity is never ending and we must con consistently challenge ourselves to do better. We believe in building the industry uh, holistically and sustainably, including investing in partnerships with organized labor by building our five gigawatt portfolio under project labor agreements, ensuring that those that are building this clean energy infrastructure are paid decent wages, work in a safe environment, and have a seat at the table and a voice on the job. Some may be familiar with the value of a union job, but what folks might not uh, be aware of is how PLAs can be designed to support priority com communities and deliver on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So in partnership with the Building Trades, our National Offshore Wind Agreement establishes diversity benchmarks and requirements to launch long-term, high-quality careers for women and people of color in the construction industry. Expanding union membership has a uh, particular relevance for diversity, equity, and inclusion because belonging to a labor union lowers the likelihood that you'll fall into poverty. Research has shown time and again that labor unions have been central to bolstering the American middle class by raising, wa raising wages and expanding access to health benefits. Union membership also reduces racial and gender disparity in wages, helping to counteract disparate labor market outcomes by race and gender that result from occupational segregation, discrimination, and other inequities related to structural racism and sexism. Um, and all of these things, living wages, access to healthcare and generous benefits play a critical role in creating positive cross-generational impacts. And we know that in terms of social mobility in this country, the greatest economic determinant in your life is your family. But uh, a goal without a plan is just a wish, a wish. So we can't expect that just by creating the demand for underrepresented workers alone, that it will produce positive revolt results. We know that we have to ensure that workers are set up to succeed and prepared and oftentimes need access to wraparound services to address employment barriers, including childcare. Uh, we recognize the need that we need to uh, meet underrepresented workers where they are and build capacity to meet the goals that we set. So in order to achieve our goals, we've adopted an integrated supply demand strategy to tackle barriers to women and people of color's participation and retention in the offshore wind industry. 
This strategy includes increasing the pipeline of women and people of color entering uh, the industry through targeted career exploration campaigns with community partners, pre-apprenticeship training, and targeted recruitment of underrepresented vocational education students. And on the demand side, like I mentioned, we're implementing workforce participation goals for women and people of color in all of our projects and a model compliance infrastructure to make sure that those goals are met. So this model construction workforce development is actually how I got my start in energy. As, as Dr. Skinner said, I'm a graduate of non-traditional employment for women, a pre-apprenticeship training program in New York City that prepares, trains, and places women in careers in skilled construction. And for me, that meant becoming an apprentice with the IBEW. Uh, and ultimately led to a more than 15 year career as an electrician. So nerves, new serves women broadly, but the vast majority of new graduates are women of color of lower socioeconomic status. The program provides work, uh, paid work experience, classroom training and rapid entry into union apprenticeship programs in the New York City metro area. And I've experienced firsthand the transformational power of pre-apprenticeship and union membership when it's paired together. And without that opportunity, I, I for sure wouldn't be sitting before you today. Um, the, women that knew, the women that knew trains and places in union apprenticeships will help construct ORCID projects by virtue of our PLA and that linkage and associated diversity benchmarks. But the benefit of union membership uh, for these women will extend far beyond ORCID projects and enable these workers to have long-term careers in construction of renewable energy projects and other projects in the area. So this is just one example. Uh, ORCID is working to launch initiatives uh, like this with pre-apprenticeship training programs uh, to support diversity, equity, and inclusion in all regions where we have a presence. And uh, we've also committed to over $49 million of workforce development funds throughout the U.S. So it's our hope and intent that other developers take these models forward uh, as they begin to think about uh, their projects um, and building up their workforce. And just very quickly to close off my re remarks, I just want to acknowledge um, that being a leader is hard. And achieving a truly diverse, equitable, and inclusive offshore wind industry will require sustained action over time. Um, and at Orsted, we'll not settle for just good enough. We have to continually reflect and seek out ways to be better. Um, and we really feel the responsibility to our community to build an offshore wind industry that centers racial, gender, and climate justice, creates values for workers, and to really do the hard work um, and have the hard conversations. We can't stop admitting the hard truth. So it's incumbent upon us to show up as imperfect partners and embrace um, the discussions with vulnerability and humility. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, really excellent com comments. Um, I think, you know, it's for me, it's so exciting to have you, someone who's so familiar uh, with construction work, with equity issues, you know, particularly in that sector and with how to do targeted you know, recruitment connected to project labor agreements as the US Director of Labor Relations at the largest offshore wind company in the world. So um, you know, thank you. And I think you know, as, as you know, many of us are incredibly excited about the potential to build a large offshore wind industry in the US. Uh, the US has the largest offshore wind market in the world. Um, it will likely be you know, a central part of how we meet our renewable energy targets in this country. Um, and we know that there's work all the way from manufacturing related to these turbines to the assembly of them, the port work that will happen, and then, of course, all of the construction and ongoing operations and maintenance work. So I think it's just an incredible opportunity for us to build a whole new industry um, and hopefully create you know, really good, high quality family and community sustaining jobs and really take on the issues of gender and race equity that we've been talking about in, in a real way. And this is, this is a good start. So thank you so much for, for sharing your perspective um, from Orsted and, and the great work that you all are doing. Um, so now I wanna keep us on track and make sure that we have plenty of time for um, questions at the end from the audience. Um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to our last but not least speaker, Amy Peterson. Um, Amy was the president, as some folks have already mentioned, of Non-Traditional Employment for Women, new in New York City. Uh, she was the director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, and now is a senior advisor in industry relations at the Department of Energy's Loan Programs Office. Amy, I think, you know, uh, uh, Gail mentioned this at the beginning of the program. Others have probably heard of Justice 40, um, Biden's groundbreaking initiative around equity and climate work. Can you say more about how the federal government is embedding equity in its rules and regulations as it relates to clean energy procurement? Are there examples uh, that you can highlight? And in prior positions that you've held, how have you seen organizations use these principles in implementing programs? Thank you, Amy. 
Great. Uh, so I'm just so excited to be here and to have heard from and learned from everyone who uh, came before me and to uh, both build on what they were uh, talking about. Both Gail and Matt used the phrase, seize the opportunity. And I've, I've heard that a lot recently. And I think I think that's what we all need to do, right? We are in a place where we are creating uh, millions of jobs in a new industry and in old industries, construction, uh, where uh, workers, and, and Matt said it better than I will, are just uh, interested and organizing and really thinking about their futures and on the ground, uh, there's a movement that is going to help us advance this work. And there's federal support. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about what the federal support looks like um, and being new to the federal government, really understanding for me how what are the building blocks that the federal government uses to, to advance what's happening and how do those help kind of build the partnerships that we want to build. And so President Biden and Vice President Harris, Secretary Granholm, Secretary Walsh um, are so committed to equity, diversity, quality jobs, clean energy, all of these things that are so important. And so it's great to be in an administration that works um, works to, to advance the things that we're all here to talk about. And they do it in, in kind of with these building blocks. So first there are these executive orders that started on the day, you know, the day that the, the president took office that really focus on tackling the climate crisis, Justice 40, ensuring the future is made all in America, advancing racial, racial equity, uh, an executive order about project labor agreements, um, a White House task force on worker organizing and empowerment, and um, taking all of these things together and figuring out how do you combine them to implement the Infrastructure Jobs Act. Um, and so that is happening um, through this interagency coordination. Uh, Department of Labor has created a Goods Jobs Initiative. Um, they're partnering uh, all the time with the Department of Education and the agencies that are most responsible for implementing uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law. So Department of Energy, where I am, Department of Transportation, Department of Commerce. And you can see um, the, the, the executive orders and the requirements for Justice 40 and diversity and the right to join a union and quality jobs going from those executive orders to the infrastructure law itself to um, this partnership between the agencies. And we've all uh, signed memorandum of understandings to talk about how we actually partner together to implement this. And coming from city government, right? The ability for kind of the, the labor and workforce programs over here to communicate with the agencies that are actually building things doesn't always happen on the ground. So to see it happening at the federal government is really exciting. And it's resulted in um, real substantial uh, requirements in uh, procurements that are going out. And I you know, strongly recommend that everyone get on every email list you can get on at the Department of Commerce and Transportation and Energy and really understand the opportunities are, that are out there and, you know, kind of get into the procurements and see that they talk about the things we've been talking about today. So they talk about apprenticeship, apprenticeship readiness programs. They talk about investing in supports for workforce. Uh, they talk about Justice 40, uh, which is where everyone um, is required to, uh, in covered programs, have 40% of the benefits so the jobs, the small business benefits, the reduction in energy burden go to disadvantaged communities. And there's been a lot of work across the, the federal government um, and across states to identify disadvantaged communities and make sure that these advantages are going to people. One example, um, and I, again, encourage you to go on energy.gov and go to the bipartisan infrastructure law page, and you'll see all of our procurements that are going out the door and there's a funding opportunity for battery manufacturing right now that actually takes 20% of the evaluation criteria and focuses on an equity plan, quality jobs and community benefits, and gets into the details of how you do that and what that should look like 
and is really encouraging that that happen. Um, additionally, the EV charging work that is happening is talking about that too. There's rulemaking out there about EV charging funding that's coming out that it will require apprentices, it will require workforce development, and it will require workforce diversity. And um, a lot of what the federal do government does is pass money down to the states. And so it, uh, the federal government is actually encouraging uh, states to support training pathways that are inclusive of women, Black, Latino, Asian American, and other represented groups. And um, really trying to work on guidance to say that that includes apprenticeship programs and pre-apprenticeship programs, and also supports, right, childcare and transportation and all the things that are important for people to move forward. Um, I'm in the loan programs office and in our office, we have $40 billion where we invest in uh, projects that have been demonstrated, so they work, um, but they're uh, not yet commercially viable. And so we provide loans and loan guarantees to these you know, huge projects across the country that um, are being done by private industry. And we're looking at and have added to our requirements uh, administration priorities so that we're thinking about quality jobs, responsible contractor standards, community hiring, diversity um, and inclusion. And, and what, I what I would say is that the way to achieve any of this at any level is building partnerships. Um, the White House announced uh, week and a half ago, the Talent Pipeline Challenge, uh, which is all about figuring out how to get employers, get labor, get training and education and philanthropy to um, commit uh, to work together to develop these relationships and partnerships so that the people that um, haven't had access to these jobs before can get access to these jobs. So I highly recommend that you all look at that. Um, reach out to me and reach out to uh, to us to um, to be part of that because that's a big deal in ensuring that we will be able to uh, to make the connections that need to happen and that have been so well demonstrated by the work that Maine's doing today. Um, just one uh, quick example of my experience in New York City and how you do need to kind of build this coalition and bring it all together is the work that we did after Hurricane Sandy to rebuild single family housing. You can imagine uh, New York City doesn't have a huge uh, residential single family housing market. Um, and uh, it's it started with uh, kind of organizing on the ground. And I love that Matt talked about that and community groups saying, you know, Sandy happened, it was horrible. And we talked about climate change and it's impacted all of these people. How do we make sure that not only do people's um, homes get repaired, but that they get to be part of the jobs and the opportunities? And so instead of trying to kind of build new systems and figure out how to do that, we really brought together the, the resources that are already in a lot of instances funded. So we brought together the city's workforce system that knows how to match employers with jobs and knows how to be on the ground and get um, people from community-based organizations. So we took that system and we connected it with the pre-apprenticeship programs. And then we said to the people who were doing the work, right, you have to hire Sandy impacted residents. And it really resulted in both people getting into the construction unions um, from the pre-apprenticeship programs. Um, it, it resulted in a new connection that really hadn't happened before between the city's workforce system, the community-based organizations and the pre-apprenticeship programs. And it resulted in, in jobs for uh, Sandy impacted residents on the projects that we were building um, and long-term careers, because that's really what it's all about. And we, we did do a project labor agreement there because we really felt it was important to ensure that we had good wages and that we had opportunities and that um, we were we were um, we were really uh, having the highest standards in the work that we were doing to rebuild that community. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. Really appreciate your comments. Um, super helpful insights. And, you know, I think one thing that comes to mind for me hearing you speak is, you know, part of this conversation that we're not focusing as much on today 
is how clean energy investments flow to frontline historically excluded communities. And you're referencing this, right? So how are solar projects built in frontline communities? How do EV chargers get installed in frontline communities? Um, how do historically excluded communities have access to putting solar panels on their homes? right? Purchasing electric vehicles, doing energy efficiency retrofits that um, bring down the cost of, of uh, heating and cooling your home. Um, so it's, you know, it's a slightly different aspect of how do we expand access to these jobs, but I think it's really linked, right? Because if you're doing the, the work in those communities, then there's kind of that natural link to, okay, the jobs are being created there, right? And we could expand access to them. So I think it's, you know, just something to kind of put a pin in for us all to be thinking about, um, you know, how do we really sort of expand access um, to the clean energy, both on the jobs front, but also in the work that we need to do to tackle climate change. And I think that's going to be essential to, to tackling climate change at scale. So, so thank you, Amy, and thanks for all the helpful examples. Um, and so, you know, with this, uh, we've got 15 minutes left. I want to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, we're getting a bunch of great questions. I just say thank you to all of our fabulous speakers. I think this has been an excellent um, discussion. Um, I think uh, the audience agrees. And we've got a number of questions that uh, came in uh, around the work, uh, Laura and Matt, that you're doing in Maine. So I'd like to start with those. Um, give me a second here to pull these up. So. Uh, the main initiatives are very inspiring, um, one audience member wrote. Is it possible to share the project labor agreements that were passed? Could you say how gender equity is specified in the project labor agreements? Is there monitoring by race and ethnicity, uh, for example, to see how many women of color may get access to the apprenticeship programs, the training opportunities, and what sort of technical assistance is available for uh, contractors and employers? So I'll put that to Matt and Laura, but others should feel free to jump in on this question. Um, I can start on that. Um, so two project labor agreements were passed into law. And I should just say by way of context for the labor movement folks in the room, um, to, to reemphasize the point about climate jobs work as an opportunity, in the last 25 years in Maine, we've had probably two project labor agreements total. Um, in the last two years, we had two PLAs both of which ran through the energy climate space, one on offshore wind, one on um, climate resilient, energy efficient, affordable housing. Um, to the specific questions, um, the statutory PLAs unfortunately do not have explicit provisions around gender and race equity, though um, the building trades and um, the developers they're likely partnering with are very committed to that. I think it'll be codified in the actual negotiated agreement. Um, we are, as part of this, uh, we're doing a, a train the trainer piece um, with Cornell in the next year or so around this pre-apprenticeship work and around racial justice in our pre-apprenticeship work. And I think really want to learn from the great work um, that Orsted referenced and really think with the trades about how do we actually codify these things? How do we link them to the pre-apprenticeship programs? And how do we hold ourselves accountable in some serious way? Because let's be real, right? The history of the labor movement on this stuff is both liberatory and oppressive and pretty uneven. And we shouldn't like, we shouldn't uh, put our heads under the pillow around that. We should be real about it and, and move into it. Um, on the technical assistance piece, I think there are tools there but I think on both the employer side and the labor side, there's a massive amount that needs to be done. And I think um, the point that was made by the first speaker or second speaker, just on like what it means to retain people in systems and organizations and structures that weren't historically built for them is a conversation the labor movement just needs to elevate like three floors. And, and to just add a little bit to that, um, the places that we're really trying to measure some of that, um, not just participation, but accountability is in our apprenticeship grants and that we're in early stages. The grants were just awarded. We're still working through the contracts on that, but the intent is to have measurable outcomes. Those resources that we're using are from ARPA funds and they're all, it's all built into it. Um, and so we will be looking at, at race, at gender, 
Um, and that's where we're putting together a toolkit. I had mentioned we've, we're working with our community college and doing a badging exercise around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion that we'll be making available for all of those grant um, recipients and then having a cohort uh, community of practice for those grant recipients. So again, early stages um, and trying to figure out what best practices are and how we can embed these principles broadly. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Laura and Matt. And does anyone else want to weigh in about these questions around um, gender and race equity in the PLAs and setting up these new training programs? I, I would add a couple things that we learned in New York City. So in New York City, uh, what we did first was through direct entry, uh, the unions each committed to a certain percentage of their next apprenticeship class to come from helmets to hard hats, um, pathways to apprenticeship, non-traditional employment for women. So it was 10% women, and it's been raised by the building trades to 15%. This most recent PLA, and they are all available on the building trades website for New York City, has both that requirement, but it also has a commitment to do the pre-apprenticeship training in partnership with the city. And then it has a, a commitment for 30% of the hours of work to go for people from low income communities, which seem to be the best way to, to get the, the right populations under the legal rubric that you can um, do. And it has a requirement for apprentices. So a lot of times um, you'll, you won't necessarily create those new opportunities by requiring apprentices be on those jobs. So 9% requirement for apprentices from those communities. So those things combined really come together to, to kind of make it work from each angle. Great, thank you. Anyone else on this question? So there's one follow-up question on this. Um, and I think this is a question that uh, Matt, Laura, Amy, and Allison uh, may be able to answer. It's a question about someone is curious to hear what you find to be the ideal cohort size for the training classes that you're running. Amy's done many more of these than anyone else in the room, so she should answer. Yeah, I've been away from it for a while, but we were at about 25, right? You need a, a size that allows you to do the hands-on work and to build the camaraderie and to, to really, uh, also seem be a group. So that's about the size we were when I was there. And I think it's a, it, I think it's a good size. Okay. Allison or anyone else wanna add on this question? No, I would agree. Um, I think that any bigger than that is, is you lose the kind of the personal connection um, and the ability to kind of identify any uh, problems that the, um, uh, that the pre-apprentice might be experiencing in their personal life that might need some extra care or social, social services around. That's great. Um, and then there's a, a related question. I'll stick with this theme for a second. Um, someone has asked, can you share some best practices on recruitment of women uh, for pre-apprenticeship programs? Um, this person currently runs a PACE program through the Urban League of Essex County. I know we've touched on this a little bit. Anything more that folks want to add around the recruitment of women into pre-apprentice programs? So I want to build on what Allison just mentioned, which is the support services. So one of the things that we have at non-traditional employment for women, they have, um, is a full-time social worker and a team actually of social workers, uh, social work interns that really help people uh, identify the services and support they need before they get in the program. So they have what they need, childcare and um, transportation and ability to, to do all of this work and a lot of things. Uh, come up in, in those discussions. And then they they stay with the people through their lives. Um, and so, so that's really important. And I think, I think building uh, relationships with other community-based organizations who are gonna be working with women and see them and see who might be a good fit for this type of program is a really good way to get people into the, to, to, to build a larger community partnership because you're having those connections and to uh, to get the right uh, women come through the door. Yeah. I guess I would just add to that is I, I don't know about the PACE program, but uh, if you're not doing dedicated uh, a dedicated women's cohort, that can also help 
um, to just have a, a, a cohort of, of free apprentices that is uh, specifically for women um, who can come in and be vulnerable and uh, not feel uh, like they're being judged by, by folks around them uh, for any you know, lack of skills or questions that they might have uh, once they walk in the door. If I can also add, I think we've seen some great examples of, you know, scenarios where there's perhaps not that many women in one class, right? And so we've seen um, certain states try approaches where they will create trades women circles or other groups that bring together women across different classes or even different trades or unions um, to discuss some of these issues. Because obviously, you know, oftentimes being a woman in the trades is a, a difficult place to be. Um, and the other place that I would, the other sort of point that I would make is I think, you know, the the question of of workplace conditions is is really crucial to this right ensuring that this is an attractive industry is is also a recruitment problem right it's not just a retention problem um so i think all of those efforts to ensure sort of efforts against workplace harassment um, ensuring an inclusive work environment don't just help people stay but they also ensure uh in improved recruitment into the the field in the first place you know i want to I think what I want to lift up what I think I'm hearing as part of this conversation, which is that, um, you know, we have to do the work to change the culture of our institutions because culture eats strategy for breakfast. So, you know, creating these cohorts um, that impact the culture that not only help with uh, retention, which ultimately people of color and some of these non, I think Matt's point earlier is you know, folks that are navigating systems that weren't set up with us in mind and how, what are we doing to change the culture of our institutions so um, so we can, you know, recruit, retain, um, and have higher representation. So important. Anyone uh, else wanna come in? Matt, go ahead. I, I just, I wanna lift up a lesson I, learned and learned again from Washington State Labor Council, um, where they've done really brilliant work on what it actually means to disrupt oppression and, and how that cycles out uh, from an interpersonal level to an institutional level to a systems level. And so for the labor movement, you know, we fight the boss hard frequently, right? And if there's the, the most small violation of a contract, we train stewards to really like enforce a contract. When workers are engaging in oppression with each other or making that sexist comment or making a racist comment or making an off-color joke on the work site, um, we don't frequently in the labor movement, if we're honest, train stewards to disrupt that. Train stewards that like we defend a contract and we also defend our brothers and sisters in like liberatory relationships. And so there's like a lot, lot, lot of work to do um to actually think about what our stewards trainings look like and what they include and how do we take a much broader perspective of what it means to defend each other both a contract and just like a collective social contract um rooted in equity and anti-oppression um and so i just I, I think unions are stumbling through that and trying to do that but i just really feel like if we're gonna make this work work and really move hearts and minds, we have to have our frontline stewards just see it as like what we do as unions. That's great, thank you, Matt. Um, okay, well, we've got two minutes left. Um, we had one other question that came in early, which is um, uh, on a different uh, theme than we've just been discussing. A person asked, approaches for those of us in non-union states. Um, <laughs> So, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's anybody in, in on the call right now that's um, working in a right to work state, but um, maybe Matt and April, you want to come in here and um, and Matt, I think this relates to the sort of organizing dimension that you brought up earlier. But any any thoughts you want to share on that and, you know, recommendations for folks working in non-union states? Well, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll just lift up that. Um, you know, there's good work happening in Texas, um, which is a right to work state. Uh, Rick Levy, the president of the, the state fed there is, um, you know, using some of the same strategies that we've discussed on this webinar in terms of identifying the policies um, where there are intersections between labor and community um, and building in project labor agreements. So um, there's good, there are good examples happening in other states and perhaps we can, someone can send out some of that information as we wrap up uh, this webinar. But I don't know if Matt has more he wants to add. 
I'll, I'll just be my, I think you can organize on these issues everywhere and whether it's municipally, whether it's on a specific solar project, whether it's organizing some part of the supply chain. So I would just, um, Climate Jobs National Resource Center is an amazing resource um, and get in touch with them, get in touch with us, let's strategize because I think this work can be moved. We need to move this work everywhere um, and, and we can. And Thanks, I, I think that's a great, oh, go ahead, Marina. Well, just to add, coming from DC, which isn't even a state at all, um, you know, I would just add want to uplift the role of the federal government and particularly the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs in um, setting and maintaining participation goals for women in underrepresented populations in federally funded construction projects. And this applies here pretty clearly. Um, and I just, you know, that would apply regardless of the context, state, no state, uh, union, non-union. And so that's just a really important lever um in ensuring that these these goals are met great thank you well, it's the pro act. Act. yes it's and pass the pro act. act yes and the pro act yes thank you um uh well it's two o'clock so we do need to wrap here i just want to say thank you so much for our wonderful speakers this was a, a excellent conversation i wish that we could continue it and we will in a future webinar so uh, thank you to all of you, and thanks to everyone who joined the webinar and for sending in your questions. We really appreciate it. Please feel free to follow up with us. We, you know, we want to be a resource to everyone who's trying to do this work. Um, and on behalf of the U.S. Department of Labor's Women's Bureau and the Worker Institute at Cornell University, I just want to say thanks again. <laughs>